started. Uh, thank you all for coming today. I know it's been a very crazy week and uh, hard to keep track of things, uh, but I'm really glad to see that you're all here. Uh, this is a continuation of our work that we've been doing on the tailed and tailless Sicilians. Uh, this is a tailed species here, uh, and this is a tailless species, and their names are very similar. This is Mogula oculata, and this is Mogula colta, so it can get very confusing, so I'll call them tailed and tailless. And if you have um, this egg, you will always get a tailed embryo. So this is a, a, ascidians have a lot of maternal factors that decide the way that they're going to develop. But if you have a tailless egg and you use a tailed sperm, then you get a little, uh, hybrid like this, and uh, now it has a little tail. Uh, the notochord is converging extends, so it has half a tail. It only has 20 notochord cells, where V has have 40 notochord cells. And you can see this pigment cell now, uh, again, re-expressed uh, where the um, otolith is. And if you look at them as adults, ascidians turn into uh, an adult that doesn't look anything like a chordate, uh, and you get this, uh, this is a, uh, the tailed species here, um, they kind of look like Amaroka. They actually have two siphons. There's one there and one there, an in-current and an ex-current. And um, this is the tail of species there. And so um, they look very, very similar as adults, but as you can see, quite different from larvae. And um, a lot of this work was the work of uh, Xander Fodor. Um, and now I have an undergraduate, Jai Tai Lui, and uh, Megan, two new graduate students, Megan Powers and Flo Visconti. And so um, we're continuing this work now uh, in my lab. Uh, and I'll give you a little update today then. So first I just uh, put my little plug in for Friday Harbor Labs. Uh, the Mogula actually live in France, so we don't work on them in Friday Harbor, but uh, it is a great place to work. I am teaching embryology there uh, this summer, uh, which we look at usually um, up to over 20 phyla, different phyla, and look at both their larvae and, and uh, metamorphosis. Uh, it's a beautiful setting. There's amazing, amazing biological diversity and students doing uh, research. And so there are graduate courses that are given in the summertime and I would encourage any graduate students or faculty to encourage your students to come. We have uh, financial support for students. Uh, there's computer lab for teaching computational methods, and um, so a lot of the stuff that I teach uh, is not only developmental, but also bioinformatics, modeling, phylogenetics, and genomics. So um, here's the deuterostomes. You are here uh, where the fish are. Those are the vertebrates, and I'm going to talk today about the tunicates, which are here. Uh, tunicates, even though their adult body plan doesn't look anything like a chordate, so this is a cephalochordate or amphioxus here, and you can see they have a body plan very similar to a vertebrate. Uh, even though their adult body plan is very different, their larval body plan, which is down here, has the chordate body plan. And it was Kovaleski um, in the late 1800s that realized um, before that tunicates were classified as mollusks, and um, Kovaleski said, no, they should be chordates because they have this chordate tadpole. And um, there's some work in my lab also on hemichordates and origin of chordates. Um, but today I'm going to talk about really about a group uh, of animals here in the mogulates. And um, just to give you the bottom punchline, um, because like I, we all said, we're a little distracted um, this year um, or this week for sure. Uh, what we found so far in these tailed and tailless ascidians is that there is change in gene expression in regulatory genes. That one of the big surprises is that the downstream <clears throat> structural genes become pseudogenes, so muscle actin, the gene for nodolith, I'm going to show you a neural gene and another gene we know, DDX517. So it turns out that there's, there are uh, mutations in these uh, RNAs, and yet the RNAs were still found in the transcriptome. And so we think that the whole larval body plan is um, uh, just being degraded uh, and so the question is, why are some of these gene networks conserved and why are some of them uh, uh, gotten rid of? Um, then we found a lot of heterochrony. So we've seen changes in the timing of gene activation, especially metamorphosis genes. So normally metamorphosis genes are not on, don't come on until way after the larva has been swimming around and goes to 
settle, but we find in these tailless mogula that they're um, on during development, which is a, a very, very early for them. And trying to figure out um, how do you do that heterochronic change. And then we, we thought we found a couple of, uh, of instances of gene loss, but it turns out when we closer analyze those in the genomes that we have now, um, it turns out that there we can find very large uh, transposons that have been uh, inserted into the gene. And so uh, they get disrupted, but we haven't found a case where we actually have found gene loss yet, which is very interesting as well. So here's where we do most of the work. This is Station Biologic in Ruskoff. Uh, it's in France. This is where uh, we could find, there's um, tailed and tailless mogulids all over the world, but this is the only place where we can get them to hybridize and we can uh, they'll hybridize without taking their membranes off. So very easy to work with. This is an old fort um, that was bought by, by Henri Lacaze Duthier. Um, and um, he bought the fort and started the marine lab to study these tailless um, ascidians. Many years later, um, Titus Brown, so there's Titus, uh, who you all know has gone off to UC Davis now, but um, Titus and I were funded by Beacon uh, with Elijah Lowe uh, to go over and um, do some transcriptomes uh, with these uh, tailed and tailless mogulids. This is a Henri Lacaze Duthier. This bust of Henri Lacaze Duthier is in the library um, there at Roscoff. He's the one who first described these tailless larvae. So he's the one who first found them in the uh, late 1800s. And uh, he started the marine lab with his family money and uh, uh, actually took them to Paris and um, held them up and said, these tailless mogulids will help us understand chordate origin. So it's uh, really interesting to be studying these again um, so many years after Lacaze Duthier founded the marine lab to study them. So what's exciting about these is that um, the tailed species and the tailless species had been described um, by Lacaze Duthier. They found eight tailless species of mogulids there at Roscoff. We've now found seven of them. There's a, still a species that I haven't been able to find. Um, but what we were able to do was we went over and found the tailed and the tailless species and said, hey, let's try cross hybridizing these. And it turns out that they cross very easily. You didn't have to take their membranes off or anything. And if you have the tailed species, if you have tailed sperm or tailless sperm, you always get a tailed larva. But if you have the tailless species, and we never see tails and we never see eye spots in this uh, tailless in the Mogula culta. But if you take the sperm of the tailed species, then what you find in some of the um, uh, hybrids is that you get a little tail, a 20. Uh, notochord tail rather than a 40 notochord tail the way this one is. Uh, and now you can see that this pigment spot that's part of the otolith, uh, you can also see re-expressed here as well. And so this was a really exciting uh, uh, system to, for us because we wanted to look at what genes are involved in making this species tailless and uh, could we see how this had happened several times independently. And that's one of the great things about the mogulids. So um, one of the things that's really important whenever you're looking at two different species is you wanna be careful to have independent contrasts. So mogula culta and oculata, these are the two that are found in France. You can see that there's a whole Roscoff clade here, which most is, many of these are found in, in France. But what's interesting is mogula pacifica and Mo mogula pugentis are both found, um, these are both found in, uh, the Pacific. And so what we think is there was originally a circumpolar group of mogulids that became tailed and tailless um, at various times. Um, we, from Beacon, we were funded to do transcriptomes from these two species for F plus three, this is a gastrula stage. F plus four would be neurulation and F plus five is the tail bite. The tail bite is when they're actually starting to make the tadpole um, itself. And we did this for both um, oculata, the tailed species, occulta, the tailless species, and the hybrids. And then later we um, got some independent funding to uh, do the genomes. And we now, um, with uh, Lionel Christian at New York University and Alberto Stolfi, who was at New York University and who now has his own uh, position at Georgia Tech, we've now done the genomes of uh, these three species. and. Uh, 
so um, we're really at a point where we can now look very carefully in the genome um, to find out uh, why we have certain genes expressed and certain genes not expressed. So one of the great things about ascidians is that they have determinate and invariant cleavage. And what that means is this is a species here, uh, Boltinia velosa, that we have at Friday Harbor Labs. And what's cool about it is it has this bright orange crescent. So you can see what's going to become the myoplasm. So ascidians go through cleavage. It's two cell, four cell, eight cell here, 16 cell. Looking from the vegetal pole, you see these bright orange cells. Those are going to make up the muscle. Um, of the larva. And then the larva uh, sits down face first, pulls its tail in, makes this little spaceship, I call it, and then it'll end up um, making a tunicate that has these two siphons. And that's an incredible process. And many invertebrates do one body plan as a larva and a different body plan as an adult. And what I'm really interested in is how does one genome uh, encode these different body plans? And then how does that evolve? How do we, uh, how does that evolve? And it's all through gene networks. And so what's interesting about all solitary ascidians is that the, the cell lineage is known in Siona and Felucia and Halicynthia. And it turns out that the cell lineage will be the same in all of these different species. So I can look at this um, embryo right here. This is from the vegetal pole. This is a gastrula stage. And I know that these 10 cells here are gonna make up the notochord in the tail. I know that these are muscle that are here. I know that this is endoderm here. And so we can look very early in development and find out um, what the tissues are gonna become. And this has been very important for uh, finding gene networks in uh, ascidians. And so here's an ascidian egg. Uh, you can see their beautiful development. So there's a two cell, there's the four cell. And it's gonna continue to divide. Um, all ascidian eggs have these follicle cells that are on the outside. And these are test cells here. Try not to look at those. They're moving around a lot, so it's hard uh, not to look at them. But this is the actual embryo here um, in the very center. Ascidians have what are what's called bilateral cleavage. They're the only phyla that have this. And that means that if you uh, look down the plane of bilateral symmetry, the cleavages are the same on either side, but um, they're not the same uh, from animal to vegetal. And uh, so as this embryo continues to divide, what's gonna happen here soon is it's gonna start gastrulation. These cells that are here are endoderm and they're actually coming from the vegetal pole. We're looking from the animal pole. So they're coming from the vegetal pole and um, they're in, uh, pushing up. And then uh, what's gonna happen is uh, once you have gastrulation, then the muscle comes from the posterior and the notochord comes from the anterior and they're gonna move and the embryo is gonna elongate and then it'll start um, to do a convergent extension. So you can see now um, that uh, the embryo um, has lots of cells here. Pretty soon it's gonna start rotating. It rotates um, right before neurulation and I'll show you where the uh, neurulation uh, is beginning, it's gonna roll and you'll see that. The rolling is important for left-right asymmetry that we know um, goes on in these embryos as well. So here it starts to roll. There's the neural tube right there, uh, rolling up. So this would be neurulation. This would be, uh, uh, this would be about uh, four hours. The gastrulation was three hours. And now it's starting to make a tail bud. So this is the head here. And what happens is, those 40 notochord cells have now made a single row of cells. And what they're gonna do now is swell. And they are what's important as far as making the tail. The muscle is on either side and the neural tube is at the very um, dorsal part. So this is dorsal back here. The neural tube would be back here. Um, the notochord is in the center of the tail. The muscle is in three rows on either side. And now you can see it's making a head and there's a tail. This would be the um, four hours now or five hour um, time point. And you can see now the notochords, see this roll, we call them a stack of coins. If you could count those, there, there's 40 cells there. All solitary ascidians have 40 notochord cells down the tip of their tail. And then you can see um, uh, pretty soon you'll be able to see that the larva starts twitching. And this shows another thing about development that's really amazing. You can see that 
the eggs started this size. So for all invertebrate larvae, you have these eggs that are a certain size and that larvae that um, develops is gonna be exactly the same size. So what's happened is you've taken one cell and you've divided it into make many cells and then um, now you've made an organism. And you can see here now the muscle is starting to twitch um, they, as the um, calcium channels uh, become activated in the tail that are gonna be involved for uh, uh, the animal to swim. You'll see that uh, they're, they're twitching now and uh, pretty soon it's gonna hatch. You can see these test cells are uh, zipping all around here kind of crazily. Uh, and uh, we're not quite sure what they do, but um, uh, this, of course, is the, is the larva here. And this larva is a chordate larva. When it metamorphoses, it's going to look um, really different. It's going to uh, completely change into a different kind of organism. And I should say, too, if anybody wants to ask questions, uh, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and just ask a question. Uh, that's the way I do it with my classes, because I don't mind being interrupted. Um, so pretty soon you're going to see that's what's going to happen is this thing's going to go off. There it goes, hatched. These test cells say, hey, hey, what happened here? And uh, they're all kind of looking around. So that's the process of uh, embryonic development in ascidians. Pretty amazing. Uh, and what we're going to look at is, is how it's so different in the tailless embryos. So here's an ascidian tadpole larva. There's that notochord that I was talking about. You can actually see the notochord here as individual cells, um, 40 cells lined out uh, along the tail. The neural tube will be up here. There's a small brain here. This is a light sensing organ. So uh, retinal proteins are right behind this pigmented cell um, in a little tiny retina. This is the otolith. So it's a single cell that's um, within this cavity and there's actually two tiny little nerves um, on either side of it uh, that uh, detect movement when it moves within the, um, the chamber. And they have all the chordate features. So they have this anterior head and muscular tail. Um, it's not postanal because they don't um, have a mouth. Um, they're non-feeding because they swim around. You can see the notochord from the anterior posterior. That's a chordate character. The hollow dorsal neural tube is up here. And the pharyngeal slits are not uh, found in the tadpole larva. Again, it's not a feeding larva. And so the pharyngeal slits will be found uh, once it metamorphoses. So what's the nervous system like? That's some of the work that we've been doing um, lately with uh, Alberto Stofi. And it turns out that in a Siona, a connectome analysis, so they took one larvae and actually um, cut it very thinly with uh, TEM, transmission electron microscope and looked at every single connection. And what they found is there's only 330 neurons in this larval nervous system. And there's only 25 cell types. And most neurons have a simple uh, sort of unbranched shape. And so each cell has on an average 49 synapses with other cells. So very, very different um, kind of nervous system. Um, these are microscopic um, tadpoles than you would find um, in say a vertebrate. And um, this beautiful work was done by Carrie Ann uh, Ryan. Uh, and here's a figure out of her paper um, where she's showing all the neurons. Most of the neurons are up here in the brain where I told you there's a little retina here behind that acellus. This is the otolith um, and there's two um, tiny neurons connecting it. Um, there's neurons out here where it's gonna uh, sit, settle down and metamorphose. And then um, there's a number of motor neurons here. And then uh, you have these other uh, uh, DCN neurons back here. And so if we look at how the notochord normally converges and extends, um, this is a cell movement that's found during development. Um, like I said, in all solitary acidians we've looked at, the notochord comes from these eight cells. So there's eight, what are called primary cell, two secondary cells. So those are 10 cells. Those 10 cells divide to 20 cells. Then they divide again to 40 cells. And then they make what's called a nodal ball. They make this like ball or pizza pie. And then they go through convergent extension. And what convergent extension is, is it the cells are moving towards the midline. So they're moving um, towards each other, towards the midline. 
And as they do that, what will happen is eventually they're going to stack up uh, into this 40 um, uh, notochord stack of cells. And then after that, they swell. So you end up with the tail that goes all the way around um, the animal. And you can see here, these are the muscle cells that are on either side of the notochord. The muscle, of course, are important for swimming. The notochord is actually important for the um, elongation of the tail. And this is Siona, which again is a tailed um, species of ascidian. But if we look at any tailed ascidian, uh, the, how the notochord forms is uh, identical in all of them. And so um, here's some work where Mogula occidentalis, so this is a, from a paper of Alberto Stofis where he's comparing occidentalis with Siona, which is uh, sort of the workhorse uh, of the ascidians that's been used to uh, uh, find many of the gene networks. And you can see that they have a, a similar hatching time. Uh, you can see that the Mogulids have a little bit bigger head and a uh, smaller tail than Siona, it's got this skinny little head and a pretty good swimmer. Uh, but otherwise, uh, they're, they're very comparable um, in timing of development. And like I said, because we know the cell lineage, we can easily go from one species to another and uh, figure out what's going on. So what we found then is um, if we look at a, a tailed ascidian now, here's the notochord here in orange, here's the neural tube in green, um, and you can see that um, otolith there. What we find in Occulta, surprisingly, is that um, it does have a pretty good neural tube. And I'm going to show you today a paper that we have that's um, in review. It, we've reviewed it, and it's in second review in evolution and development. Actually shows that um, these tailless ascidians have motor neurons and have a pretty good uh, nervous system, even though it's kind of smushed in there. Because you can see that here, what happens is, uh, as a tail curls around, the nervous system um, gets elongated. Whereas in these tailless ones, they never go through that elongation. So it, it's kind of like an accordion. It's kind of squished in there. Uh, but you can see that they, um, by labeling, I'll show you that they actually do have a pretty good nervous system. What's really um, strange is that the notochord makes this nodal ball and it has a lot of the notochord genes expressed, but it never converges and then stends. And when we have the hybrid, what happens in the hybrid is now um, we get that otolith back and the pigmented cell back that we didn't have before, and we find that they converge and extend. What's really interesting is that it turns out that this um, tyrosinase, the gene that makes this black pigment, is mutated in the tailless one. And so now we know that that's why we never see it in the tailless. And here in the hybrids, we've shown that it's actually the tailed species uh, gene that's being expressed there that is still intact. And um, I'm gonna show you that for the muscle as well. So the surprise to us was that there's a bunch of pseudogenes that are still in the transcriptome, they're still expressed um, in this tail of species, um, but we think that eventually they're gonna be shut off and we think we, we've got just got found a time in evolution that it's been recent enough that we can see this stage that goes on um, in when you lose a, an organ. So here's the hybrids, um, looking at them real carefully. This is, a, you can see the little tail here. There's the notochord. This one is kind of squished under a slide, so you can say, kind of see the notochord there. Here's a section. So you can see that even though there's 20 cells, that the 20 cells are now aligned um, by convergent extension. So they form pretty well. But what doesn't form is uh, the muscle. So these are the, the what were the presumptive muscle. Um, this is stained with, uh, acetylcholinesterase, which stains the muscle in ascidians. And you can see that the tail or the notochord goes down here, but the muscle doesn't, uh, is completely non-functional. And what we show now is that the muscle genes, again, are pseudogenes that have uh, mutations in them and are disrupted. And so they'll never become muscle. And so even you, so you get this little tiny tail, the, the um, larva can't go anywhere because it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't have any locomotion. So one of the cool things about um, ascidians is that a lot is known about the gene network um, for uh, the notochord um, and very early a maternal gene, beta catenin turns on FOXD, this is transcription factor, which turns on signaling molecules that then turn on this transcription factor, brachyuri. It's a T-box transcription factor. It comes on in the presumptive notochord. In ascidians, it's found only in the notochord. 
And then there's a whole ne network um, that uh, is turned on. This is from uh, zebrafish, but again, you can see it's very similar. No tail here is actually brachyuri. And um, you can see that there's, um, we've got these networks where then um, these are also T box genes that are turned on here um, that ends up with a functioning notochord. And what happened was um, early in studying notochord, this is brachyuri here. This is that T box gene that comes on first um, in ascidians. And then what you can see is these are all the downstream genes. And you see that many of these don't come on until later. Um, but we have a good set, about 300 genes um, that we uh, know are involved in notochord uh, development um, in ascidians. And this is just a higher power of that. So you can see those, the first four and then the eight plus two, which is the 10, uh, and then you um, get it expressed. So our first thought was, oh, Brachyuri must be mutant in these talus. And it turns out Brachyuri was not mutant. Um, here's the tailed species. Here's the talus species. And here's the hybrid. And you see that they have this little upside down smile um, with the eight plus two, which is 10. And so they start out with a 10, uh, same notochord. But then what happens is uh, in the tailed one, eventually that'll, they, they make 20 and then they'll make 40. But in the hybrid and occulta, what we found is they didn't go through that last division. They made only 20 cells. So um, there is a defect in the number of cells that are there too. So many of you remember Elijah Lowe. Uh, Elijah uh, got a PhD at uh, MSU with uh, Titus Brown and then uh, went and did a postdoc in Italy for a couple of years. And then he worked with Alberto Stofi and um, he just uh, joined the CDC in Atlanta. I don't know if you all need that, but um, this is Elijah when we were um, at Roscoff working uh, and he was uh, along with us, did a lot of the computational stuff, but did some of the lab stuff as well. So one of the things was when they did the transcriptome, when we did the transcriptome, then I, we didn't have a genome at the time. So trying to assemble it was gonna be a real uh, trick. So we did the RNA uh, localization, and this is where Titus um, figured out this digital normalization, which is a way of uh, once you have a couple sequences that are the same, you throw away the rest of the sequences. So you get rid of about 95% of the data, and then it's much easier to assemble. And then you can go back and identify the genes, figure out what it is, and then um, go back and do the counts uh, once you've got the whole thing assembled. So you have all these sequences, you filter out um, everything, most of the data, and then you end up with unique sequences and then you do the, um, the uh, assembly. And what we found was we got, first of all, the, one of the big surprises is we got 13,000 genes out of these three different stages of development. Most Ascidians have 12 to 15,000 genes. So we almost got the entire genome out of this uh, these trans three transcriptomes. And you can see that um, if you did the digit normalization or the raw assembly, which people were doing at the time, um, we still got most of the genes out of both of those. And so um, after that, I think, uh, I know a lot of people now have um, do that digital normalization at just as a first pass when they're doing assemblies. How did we evaluate it? We had a few cl genes cloned already from these um, species. And so we were able to find them in the transcript. And you can see that um, they were about 96% uh, the same as what we had already cloned. Um, and that's sort of what you would expect um, for in a population uh, as well. So then you can go back and do the quantitation. So now once you have the genes all assembled um, and you have them assembled, then you can go back and quantitate and figure out um, how much of each gene uh, was being expressed then. And one of the surprises is that um, it turns out that the tail of species just hasn't, um, hasn't just shut off expression because you can see here, um, this is the tail of species and this is the tailed species. And you can see that they have a lot of genes expressed. It was surprising um, during these developmental stages, they have about over 10,000 genes expressed. <clears throat> but what we're interested in here is down here where there is a much smaller number of genes that were expressed in one and not in the other. And so we're, we sorted through those to try to find things that we thought might be involved in uh, making taillessness. 
<clears throat> one of the things we're really interested in is notochord. So you can see here, if uh, genes were expressed the same in both the tailed and tailless, you would find the notochord genes right on this line. And you can see that in the hybrids, uh, the red genes here are the notochord genes. More of the tailed species genes are expressed here than the tailless ones. Um, but we haven't been able to find what's different in the notochord yet. Everything we've looked at uh, seems to be on and expressed just fine in the tailless. So we haven't figured out that convergent extension question yet. One of the things, genes we looked at was prickle. Prickle is the bald and planar cell polarity. Um, that's this, um, you can see they being expressed here um, in the green. And this is how they do that convergent extension. Um, this is a, it, from a zebrafish or something that has a multicellular um, notochord, but you can see how then um, these, this is a mutant here, but what happens normally is prickle is expressed and then that's what gives you the single line of cells. And if you don't have prickle, then you end up um, with sort of a chunky, um, difficult um, notochord. And this was an in-situ that um, Eli did, so I like to show it. Uh, and uh, you can see here in Siona that this is uh, prickle express. This is uh, during a stage where the, the, there's 20 notochord cells and you can see them there um, expressing prickle in purple. And um, this is a Mohila culta, the tail of species. And you can see that prickle was on a right place at the right time. Uh, and so it was frustrating because most of the genes we've looked at for notochord are expressed um, at the right time in the right place. I showed you brachyuria already, and this is prickle. Uh, so we still haven't figured out what's going on with the notochord, and we're um, going upstream here now to see um, if we can find one of these that, that uh, may be uh, different. Uh, well, so then we got involved in the genome. So here we are at Roscoff. Um, there's Elijah uh, dressed up. We were going out. We decided to go out in the field. We'd been working really hard and it was a nice day. And I said, hey, let's go look for Siona in the wild. We found some in the wild, they're pretty fun. This is Leonel Chris John. Leonel is at uh, NYU. Uh, and uh, he's a person that uh, we collaborated with to do the sequencing of the genomes for the three species. Leonel is heart, interested in heart development, so he was really interested in whether the heart developed early in these tele species, and unfortunately it doesn't, it develops exactly the same, so uh, he has kind of lost interest in it now, but Alberto and I are still uh, working on these. There I am, and then uh, this is Claudia Rachikopi, and I'm going to show some of her work um, that she did uh, with the tyrosinase. So what we did was we sequenced um, all three of these species, and uh, Elijah and Titus helped us assemble them. And uh, they're on the aniseed genome site. And so all ascidian genomes are on the site aniseed, which is um, in France. And it's a fantastic site. I think there's about 13 genomes up there now. Uh, there's very little centenese. So genes are arranged the same way on the chromosome uh, in any ascidian. But in mogulas, the mogula culta, oculata, and occidentalis, we've been able to find centenese. Um, which was really nice because then we can go through and we can try to find uh, upstream regions that are important um, as enhancers and, you know, et cetera. So there's Leonel and Claudia uh, working at Roscoff. Uh, these animals are only gravid for about four or five weeks in, in France. And so uh, even though you're there in France, uh, we work very hard and very fast. So one of the things we knew is that in the tail of species, we never saw an eye spot. And in the hybrids, sometimes we see tails. So there's the one with a little tail with a notochord, but no eye spot. And then sometimes we would see eye spots. So you see here, this Odla, you see this one here, and uh, you see this one here, that uh, you can see really clearly that the space that it's in here. And sometimes we'd see them without space. We, we're not sure that those would be functional. Um, there also are, like I told you, two nerves that are attached to this and you can't see them here. Um, but that's another thing that we uh, could look for in the hybrids. Whoops, I went the wrong way there. So um, what Claudia did was she cloned um, these, uh, the tyrosinase that's uh, evolved in that uh, making that pigmented cell. And what she found is that if you look, so the tailless species is on top, tail, tailed is on top, tailless is on bottom. 
And what you find are uh, mutations. So here's a mutation, here's the tyrosinase uh, gene here. And here's a mutation, you see it's a, a change of four base pairs. What that's gonna do is change the coding region and then cause a stop soon afterwards. So you're gonna um, only get this much of the messenger RNA in the protein made. So it's gonna be a non-functional protein. There's two tyrosinases um, in the tail of species and uh, with the other one, she found the same thing. So again, uh, if you look at the tailed species, they had a single gene, uh, but these multiple genes had stop codons. And then there's again, a disruption of the open reading frame. Uh, so you end up uh, with a non-functional protein. Now, the surprising thing is that these were in our transcriptomes. These transcripts were in our transcriptomes. So this is a functional structural gene um, that in the tail of species has become non-functional and uh, is still expressed. And we found this for the muscle uh, actins as well. They become pseudogenes and they're also expressed. And so uh, one of the things we're trying to do is figure out now, how could we go through the transcriptome and see how many of those genes of the 10,000 are actually pseudogenes. Uh, and the dogma would be that these were shut off and they're not shut off yet, but we would expect that they would eventually be shut off. Okay, so, uh, so this is Alberto Stofi. Alberto was a postdoc with Lionel at NYU, and now he has his own uh, lab at Georgia Tech. And this is Nadine Peraris. And Nadine is a, a, does, a, a, she's a microscopist. And so she um, came out from Paris um, to work with this, and Alberto came over, and we are continuing to, to work on these molecules. And so um, this now again is what the uh, nervous system looks like in Siona. And this is what it looks like in Occulta. And I'm gonna show you some of the data, but this is a, a compilation that uh, my undergraduate uh, August um, put together for us. And what was really interesting to us is that these motor neurons, the motor neuron normally are attaching to the muscle and cause the contraction. These motor neurons are there and intact uh, in the tail of species and they have a pretty good brain and um, they have these little papillae that um, are gonna be involved for metamorphosis as well. Uh, so this seems very odd because they don't, um, the muscle never moves, the muscle has pseudogenes, um, but the nerves are intact. And so um, this, these are some of the um, pictures that we got with Nadine uh, on the confocal. And you can see on this one really nicely, this is the notoball here. And one of the surprises is that um, when Xander did in situ hybridization uh, of about 10 uh, notochord genes, they all were expressed in the notochord uh, just the way you expect them to be. So you're surpri we're surprised that it's not doing convergent extension. Uh, it might be because you need the notochord developmentally to um, stimulate other tissues. So this is the nervous system. And again, uh, anybody who looks at a nervous system would be a little skeptical of this. When Nadine first saw these embryos, she was kind of mad at me. She said, you brought me all the way from Paris for this. And I said, no, no, this is cool. This is what's cool about it. Um, because the nervous system doesn't lay out the way that it usually does, because again, these animals are kind of squished together. This one is hatching and it's hatching anterior to posterior. So you can see notochord is always found in the posterior where you expect it. And uh, the neural tube is sort of above it. So um, this is a stain now with DAPI and um, uh, also with phylloidin. And this you can kind of see is a neural tube with the neural pore. And um, this is from a paper that we just, um, again, has sent for the second time to evolution and development. And <clears throat> the surprise was that when you use these, uh, these are all the tail of species now, and you use these genes that are involved looking at the motor ganglion. So these are all different genes brain one cut here, neurogenin, MNX. Then you can see that these motor neurons uh, are found and intact in a culta, the tail of species. One we didn't see was islet. And islet was really hard because islet's also expressed in the notochord. So it was hard to tell what was notochord. We think this was the notoball. And uh, uh, it could be that there were a couple of labeled cells there, but we couldn't um, see them. 
And uh, again, this is just showing you that uh, if you comp compile that, it turns out that they're still making these motor neurons, even though there's no uh, muscle there. So we're not sure whether um, this whole larval network is going to eventually fall apart and that it's just stochastic and you start to lose genes and then the networks are going to start falling apart and then eventually you're going to just get rid of the larval body plan entirely. Um, or it could be that there is selection to maintain these genes because they could be used in the adult nervous system. And so one of the things is that um, one of the things we're interested in looking at is in the adults to see if we see a notochord network or um, a C uh, look at their nerves and see whether these same genes are used in the adult because that would um, maintain strong selection to keep those genes and keep them intact even though they're used in the larva um, and they're not doing anything in the larva now. So the one um, <clears throat> different gene that we saw was EBF. So this is EBF which is, which is expressed um, in the brain here and you can see uh, in the brain this is the tailed species and this is a tailless species. Oh, no, this is a tailed. And you, you can see in the motor ganglia here in the tailed species is lit up pretty well. But this one, this is a tailless. It, it looks like there's not as much expression. And so uh, what we were trying to do is look again like we did with the, um, the tyrosinase and see in the hybrid, do we have a mix of both the tailless um, and the tail genes or um, do we have just the one? And it turns out that if you look at the hybrids, uh, mostly what we see is RNA from the, from the tail uh, species. <clears throat> and so this, what we're able to do then is we're able to go in and this is oculata. Now this is upstream. So this is where the enhancer would be. And there's an e-box. And then there's another binding site there. This is actually um, the enhancer for EBF. And you see that occulta has a lot of changes. This is the tailless. And it turns out that if you take this and put it into the occulta, and then you take that and put it into Siona to see if it drives the expression of EBF, it doesn't, it kills it. But, uh, what, we, but what didn't work was you should be able to then take um, this oculata sequence and put it into occulta, and we did that and tried to drive expression in Siona, and it turned out it still didn't work. So, there might maybe other parts of the enhancer um, that aren't working here. But uh, what we've been able to do is do the functional studies of these um, by working with Siona, which is a tail decidian, um, sort of throughout the year. And then we can go back to uh, France and do the uh, experiments with the Colta inoculata there. And this is just showing that we can, one of the ways to really do a lot of the gene function is to do electroporation. And so this is a, a tail of species electroporated. So we can make these constructs and um, go back and electroporate them. And so then just, just to summarize, uh, this is stuff that Beacon uh, uh, funded us for. So digital normalization performs as well or slightly better than raw read assembly. In, I, like I said, I know Titus and a number of people still use this now. Um, both tail and tailless species express the majority of known notochord genes, which found we were sort of surprised. And they always have this nodal ball, but they do not converge and extend. And now we've looked at other tailless species and other tailless species have that same hit where they, um, they make the ball so the notochord is specified and makes this ball, but never converges and extend. Many of the call to larval genes have become pseudogenes, but are still expressed, and constructs can be electroporated so that we can continue to examine gene function. So I just want to thank Beacon. Uh, it's been wonderful to be a part of Beacon. Uh, great colleagues. Uh, the funding that we had for this exciting research program benefited uh, greatly from uh, Beacon methods, um, leadership opportunities, and support for female faculty. And, uh, Beacon did uh, find quite a few of our graduate students for travel and courses, and uh, we greatly appreciate um, all of that. And then uh, I just want to thank uh, the many people that worked on this. Uh, Kristen Andrakovich was a Beacon intern at Freddie Harbor one summer, and um, she is in graduate school now. Uh, it was a great experience for her. Um, Xander uh, did a lot of work on this, and now we have uh, August and uh, Megan and Flo that are working on this in the lab. And uh, Carrie uh, became a graduate, she was an undergraduate in the lab and uh, went 
to Duke for grad school and just graduated with her PhD and is on a postdoc now. Um, Titus and Kanjan and Eli I put here in Michigan State. Of course, Titus is, is in uh, at UC Davis now. Uh, and Elijah, I told you, just um, got a job at CDC. And then uh, Lionel, who's at New York University, and Alberto, who was at New York and now at Georgia Tech. And I just wanted to thank them all. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and dedicate this to Xander, uh, who did a lot of this work. And I'll take questions. I have one. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have a couple hypotheses and a question. Good. I, was wondering, I love hypotheses. <laughs> is, is, so first hypothesis, I'm, uh, it seems that the ancestral state would be the tailed state. Is that right? Yeah, so one of the things I actually use this, uh, let, let me just um, find that slide. I actually use this on uh, evolution exams sometimes hmm. uh, because uh, it's very hard to tell if you if you're just looking, say, with parsimony or something like that, what it would be, uh, because in uh. each clade you have both tailed and tailless. But what we found is in a tailless species, and we've looked in several tailless species that they they have pseudogenes, and the pseudogenes are different. So if you look in this clade at this tailless species and this tailless species and this tailless species, all of their muscle active genes are pseudogenes, but in different ways. So, so there seems to be something predictable about the way that once they are no longer uh, making muscle, that they get these hits. Um, but they, it happens in different ways, like where it is in the gene is different. Okay, so that, that leads to my uh, other hypothesis and other question. It looks like eyes and tails always go together, which would make sense because without an eye, there is no reason to move. And if you can't move, there's no reason to have an eye. Right. But that makes me wonder, what did the tailed ones do with their tails? And what is it about the places where the tailless ones live that let them get by without tails? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, yeah, that's one of the million dollar questions. So <clears throat> Beryl's idea was that, um, so Beryl was somebody who worked a lot on tailless decisions. And his, his idea was that when there wasn't selection for a tail, it wouldn't matter if you had one or not. One of the things we've done is mapped out where they are, and um, they're mostly on the poles. So they're in places where you have very high um, tides. Uh, and it turns out part of, partly that's because probably around the equator, that's where the coral reefs are, and those are mostly colonial ascidians. Colonials usually win uh, where it's a very, uh, where there's a lot of food and there's a lot of sunlight because a lot of them uh, uh, have symbiotic organisms. So it turns out that these are mostly in the poles and it may be that um, there, there would be selection against, I mean, basically what they do is they get up in the tide and then they go, they're not like a fish where they can swim a long way. Love your background there, uh, Ingo. <laughs> uh, but these aren't, they're, they're very tiny. So what they're doing is getting up into the water column and then getting, getting out. And it might be that it'd be better for you just to stay where you are. Like where we, we get them in France, there's just mats of them. Mm. And we think they don't go very far. Like they just get spawned out and then they sit right on top of mom and dad and, you know, make another generation. Uh, <clears throat> and so that's our idea. We, uh, Matt, all right, Max, I had a student that tried to figure out like, we think that the tailless ones are probably going to extinction, but maybe if you keep speciating, and you make enough of them, you're going to actually win, even though they're going to extinction. Uh, but we weren't able to actually prove that with the number. We didn't have enough numbers of species to do that. Hmm. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Billy. Great talk. Hey, Ingo. Thank How's you. it going? Good. Um, I came a few minutes late, so maybe you said that. But the fact that you can have hybrids can you do any type of QTL mapping? Yeah, that's a great question. So we've been trying to um, to culture them, and that <clears throat> that would be my dream. I'm trying to get a facility uh, like at Friday Harbor somewhere so that you know you can culture uh, 
you usually can't bring animals from somewhere else. And so they were doing it at Roscoff. And the last time that I went, they had seeded them with these animals. But what happened was uh, it was a different Mogula species that was in the tank. So they had adults and I was so excited. So I was like, oh, this is gonna be great. We can look at these hybrids. But it turned out that they were, some other Mogula had come in and they couldn't tell them apart. So I gave them a little Mogula primer and I know that they were trying again, but I haven't heard uh, what's going on, but that's really what we would need to do. Uh, and I would love to do that. That might be the only way to get at some of these things. Cool. And the other question, um, have you tried transplantation of let's say notochord cells from one species to the other to see if, you know. That, yeah, that would, be a, that would be a great thing. So we, we brought Bill Bates uh, one summer, or maybe it was two summers, but he very good at his hands and doing those kind of experiments. Uh, what happens is, uh, Occulta, the tail of species, when you section them too, sometimes there's holes in them. And I, you know, I was like tearing my hair out, like, why are these not working? And it, we think that they're, the cells aren't held together as much. Uh, because what would happen is that with the tailed species, you can take the chorion off with the protease and they'll just continue to develop. And that's how people do electroporation and stuff like that. When you do it with the tailless ones, uh, they're a little bit more fragile and sometimes they just fall down into a little pile of cookies. So he was very frustrated because when he was trying to do that and move those cells, uh, he couldn't get the, the tailless ones to stick around him the way they should have. Hmm. But that would be a great, I would love to do that experiment. Cool. Thank you. Good idea. Well, thank you. Thank you guys for coming and watching. I know it's been a crazy week and certainly <laughs> crazy day to day. Yeah, thank you so much, Billy. That was a great talk. Thanks. Yeah, it's good to see everybody. Good to see you too.